All right, so welcome to the 18th meme seminar. It's been a while since we've had the last one because nobody wants to sign up and everybody's being lazy. <laughs> um, so thank you, Mohana, for signing up. Uh, since I made that announcement, uh, two people have contacted me and said they want to present. So I think we'll just go by like, if somebody wants to present, I'll organize it and um, we will forego the regular schedule programming. <laughs> um, so Mohanan, uh, da, 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 da. I wrote a big thing about you, did some internet stalking. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm wondering, how did you get this information? <laughs> like, there are never, I have my ways. What? There are things that you wrote that I completely forgot about. <laughs> <laughs> are they accurate though? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. Oh. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I did this <laughs> like seven years ago. <laughs> so Mohanad is uh, originally from Egypt. Uh, he did his bachelor's in biotechnology at Cairo University in Giza. Uh, then he did a postgraduate diploma in global studies and management at the Al Sawi <laughs> Culture Institute, and then a master's in genetics back in Cairo. And then he worked for a while in Cairo doing uh, research and teaching. And now he, uh, after meme, he is now doing his PhD in the Department of Integrative Evolutionary Biology at the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Tübingen, Germany. And today he will be talking about uh, nematodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, and I'm happy to be here with all these nice, familiar faces. Uh, uh, Ari, if I'm pronouncing this correct? Yes, hello. I think we met very shortly when I was doing my meme studies, but nice to see you again. Likewise. Hi. So can I share my screen? Thank you. So I hope you see my screen. Do you see the presentation? Yes, great. Okay, um, so like when I talk about nematodes in evolutionary biology, people actually do not expect what I'm going to talk about. So, um, you know, I, I'm very, this is why, what I see under the microscope. I see one worm eating the other one. And what actually <coughs> drove me to, to study this system that I am really fascinated by uh, behaviors and how animals can take the right action at the right time, especially when they are very small like these nematodes. But what was more fascinating for me is my son. So when, uh, like, I think most of us, like a few of us met in 2018 when we were in this Finland the, the evolutionary biology meeting. So before I go to the meeting, I bought him this shelf of toys and because we are in Germany, so he speaks German better than me. And in the last shelf, he would have his favorite toy, which he would say auto to get it. But then if the auto is a little bit in the second shelf or a little bit higher, he would say healthy, which is help me. And then I bring him the toy. Then I went to the conference in Finland. It was almost a week. And when I came back, he could actually stand. And when the auto is in the second shelf, he would not say healthy anymore. When it is in the first shelf, he will go down and grab it. On the third shelf, he will say healthy because it's still very high above his reach. So I think this is plasticity and this is what I'm really interested in. So I would say that his uh, ability of asking for help uh, is what I call behavioral plasticity his ability of changing his, uh, uh, if he's standing or if he's uh, sitting, this is morphological plasticity and the change of what is the auto, I will call it the environmental fluctuation. So I am literally interested how to choose the best strategy and when to perform it with the highest benefit and the lowest cost. But definitely I'm not going to do this with my son trying to reach his toy. So I'm doing this with this nice worm. So it's not a C. elegans, it's another worm. It's called Pristianca specificus. So it's a free living worm. So it does not uh, live with any, uh, um, uh, um, like it's not a parasitic nematode, for instance. 
um, you can easily grow it in on E. coli <laughs> in the lab. Uh, it's a hermaphrodite, which is a very important point. So it is still fertilizing. Um, ge the generation time is very small, four to five days. We have a fully sequenced and annotated genome. And most of the genetic manipulation tools are available. So like CRISPR um, is working well. People now are, um, many of the epigenetics, like histone modifications, checking small RNA, all of these things are working in the system. And we have a collection of more than 30 different Prisianko species and hundreds of strains. So what is the morphological plastic phenotype that we study in the lab? It's the mouth morph. So some of the worms, well, can you see my, the mouse here moving? Okay, great. Um, so some of these worms will have this big mouth. It's more complicated. Uh, you can see that the uh, teeth will look more like a clue. And there is another mouth which is less complicated, it's much simple, and it's a small one. We call this Eurus tomatus and we call this Stenus tomatus. I will, starting from now, I will refer to the more complicated mouth as EU and the simple one as ST. <laughs> the EU mouth can predate, so it can actually eat other worms like this. So in this video, it's the Pristianca specificus when you put it with other worms which is C. elegans, the very well-known worm. And it can kill the worm, suck whatever inside of it, like open the cuticle, suck whatever inside of it, and then leave the corpse there. Why the stainless tomatoes one is not predatory, they only can eat bacteria. So this is the morphological and behavioral plasticity. But one very important thing that, that this decision is irreversible. So if a worm at some point during development uh, according to the environmental condition around it, decided to be EU or ST, it cannot go back. And this is very important. So you need to choose the right strategy according to what is around you, or it will be very costly. So in, uh, in Ralph's lab where I work, <coughs> um, the, this is, an, uh, they, they call it as, an, uh, we try to understand the uh, rule of plasticity in evolution. So I have some projects where I work on the morphological plasticity. I study genes, environments, and development. Others where I do more behavioral stuff when I involve some neurons or neural work. And I hope, hopefully very soon by the end of my PhD, I can find the ecological relevance and connect the dots between morphological plasticity and behavioral one. Uh, but to study behavioral plasticity, uh, so, uh, so are, um, is it fine if anyone would like to ask anytime, right? Actually, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, so these things live in soil or, or where are they living? This is a beautiful question. So they live an association, they call a necromantic association with beetles. So what happens that I did not include the slide here, uh, but uh, oh, we can talk about it. So, um, so you know that worms have what they call the dower stage. Um, so if when they don't find food around them, they go to this, stage of development where they stop their development. So they stay at the same stage for a long time. Um, at this stage, they go in association, they are in the soil, but uh, they are attracted to some pheromones for, for some uh, beetles. They go to, with these beetles, these beetles fly, go everywhere. And then when the beetle dies, all the microbial uh, 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 um, populations will grow to eat the carcass. And then the worm will sense this microbial information and then it will exit the hour and continue its growth and eat this bacteria and propagate. And when the bacteria is not there anymore, they go to the hour and they look for another beetle and so forth and so on. So they live in association with these beetles, but you can find them in soil. Uh, how do they collect them in the lab? They go to, uh, I will go talk about this later. They go to this island um, uh, La Réunion, if I'm pronouncing this correctly in, in French. Um, and then they, they just keep uh, collecting beetles. They kill the beetle and um, you, they put the beetle on the plate. And then a few days later, you see hundreds, if not thousands of worms coming out of this beetle. You. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very disgusting, uh, dis disgust, disgusting picture of this, but uh, yeah, I removed it. <laughs> because of this reaction, exactly. So, so what we did in the lab before I joined, my nice friend, Dr. Lightfoot, who now has his own lab in 
and just started his own lab in Caesar Institute studying this more, uh, he developed with Martin uh, what they called a uh, corpse assay. So this is a very robust behavioral assay to detect the ability of these worms to kill. So what he will do is um, he will collect 20 different adults. They are all the Urus tomatoes, so the predatory mouth form. And then um, he will collect another worm juveniles. So not adult stage, they are smaller, thousands of them, and put these all together at the same plate and leave them for 24 hours. And on the next day, he will come using, using the microscope, he will count the number of corpses of this uh, juvenile stage, what we call J2. So you can see this is an adult worm eating a J2. Um, and that's how he can evaluate how much killing can he see for each strain. <laughs> But the question was, is Pacificus really cannibalistic? So do they really feed on their own? And he had this very nice paper two, two years ago in science where um, he actually could discover what he called self one. So it's a self recognition gene. So here in the Y axis, this is the number of corpses. On the X axis are different species of Pristiancus. Uh, this is the predator, this is the prey. So if you add the prey of the same uh, species, they will not eat them. But when you add C. elegans, which is a completely different worm, you can see that they start to eat. So they can really recognize, which is amazing, um, their kids on the same plate. So if you add uh, the worm with their kids and with other worms, uh, they have a very nice video where they have fluorescent worms, uh, uh, self progeny. You can see that they will uh, touch their own kids. They will not bite them but then they move a little bit, they touch the other worm and they will bite it at the same plate in very few seconds. So what he did that he could discover the gene, he mutated this gene, uh, knocked out the gene like, and he discovered this hyper variable region. And then in the end, he could make this worm kill their own kids. So he identified the self one. This is the gene that is responsible for self Um <laughs> When I joined the lab, um, um, there was a recently published paper like three years before I joined uh, that they checked how many Eurus tomato strains, uh, sorry, how many uh, Eurus tomato percentage exist in how many Pristianca specific strains. So in the Y axis is the uh, percentage of big mouth Eurus tomatoes, and the, in the X axis is the number of strains. And as you can see that most of the strains are Eurus tomatoes. So most of these animals are predatory. Only a few of them are non-predatory. So, um, what, uh, so from now on, I will just keep this word self one here. So you remember that there is a gene that is responsible for killing a certain condition called self one and EU is the big mouth, ST is the small one. <laughs> so what I did when I joined that, we have more than 30 species. So I took 29 of them. We collected them from all around the world, America, Europe, and Asian clade. I checked their mouth morph. I checked if they are EU or ST. But before I, I was doing this, uh, I need to introduce you to, I, I told you in the beginning that this Pristianca specificus, it is this species, is a hermaphroditic species. So it is only hermaphrodites and you can find very few males in the population. But there are other species where it is gonacharistic species. So you can find females and males. So you have two different distinct modes of reproductions in the whole phylogeny. So, Hermaphroditism evolved six times independently in, 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 in this uh, uh, phylogeny. So we have six, uh, seven different hermaphroditic species, while the remaining species are females and males. What I did was very simple. I just like kept checking what is the percentage of mouth form, uh, how much is EU, how much is ST in all of these different species. And to make a long story short, Surprisingly, we could find a very strong correlation between the mode of reproduction and the mouth form type. So most of the hermaphrodites are EU, while most of the gonacharists or the females are ST. And the question was, so why is this? Why females would prefer to be non-predatory or hermaphrodites would prefer to be predatory? So the hypothesis was, uh, very simple. Maybe females want to be ST to avoid killing their own mating partners, right? Because hermaphrodites, they don't need to mate. They just like reproduce while females need to find a partner. 
So to test this, I went to uh, uh, Pristiancus uniformis. It's um, uh, a female strain uh, uh, species. I took three different strains. The first thing that I did, I tested, uh, this is the prey, the predator. So I tested these strains against their own selves to make sure that they still have self-recognition. So here, if it is white, there is no, no corpses. So they recognize their own self. Uh, if we see from one to 30 corpses, we say like, this is a moderate killing more than 30. <laughs> so it's a very strong killing uh, uh, species. So first thing, single strain, I guess it's own self, there is no killing at all. But to make sure this is the same species, I actually crossed them uh, and uh, I, could, I could get a viable fertile F2. So they can actually uh, uh, mate and produce viable progeny. So the second thing is I started to test them against each other. And that was true. I only selected for the predatory mouth morph. And I could see that although they do not kill each other, they do not kill their own kids, they kill each other, but they can mate. And this would argue for what I was just saying that they are stainless tomatoes or they are having the non-predatory mouth form to avoid killing a potential mating partner. But not only this, so then I generated hybrid. So I made a mating between two different strains and then I tested if they killed their own kids and if their kids killed them and it was a massacre. Everyone is killing everyone. So you really destroy the self recognition system. They don't know if they are different species. They don't know a uh, strain. They know if they are their own kids. It's everyone's killing everyone. And the conclusion is very clear. <coughs> Sorry, it's very clear. It seems that females prefer to be stainless tomatoes or non uh, predatory so they can avoid uh, killing potential mating partners and also to avoid uh, parent offspring conflict. <coughs> Wait, can I interrupt you again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what exactly is the strain in this concept? Because I feel like uh, fungi people mean something, you know, bacteria people mean something, now nematode people mean something. Yes. Yes. What is the strain? I, I'm really happy with these questions because this is exactly the questions I expect from non nematodes. nematodes. So I don't like the definition of a strain myself. <laughs> uh, um, so a species in, in our system, what we, we use as a species is uh, when we do uh, the uh, mating test and they can produce viable F2 progeny, this is the same species. So, um, and this is the normal uh, uh, reproduction um, uh, definition of a species that they can reproduce well, right? But a strain is, if we isolate Prisianca specificus in year one, and then we find that uh, in year 2016, and then we go in, in year 2017 to the same location and we got Pristianca specificus. When we sequence these animals with specific markers or even whole genome sequencing, you find so many different SNPs in these things. And we call this different strains or different isolates. So they are not, they are the same species, but they are isolated at different time points and they have a different genomic uh, composition. <laughs> is this clear? But, but then why is it that you don't like it? Because like right now we have thousands of strains and every year we're, and, and every single, like the, the mutation rate is very high and although the genome is not very small. Um, so um, I'm wondering when are we going to reach uh, um, a maximum, uh, what do you call this in English? Uh, well, the, the maximum capacity. Uh, like a plateau? Saturation. saturation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I wonder when are we going to reach, reach uh, saturation? And I don't see this happening. Like they are evolving too fast. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is better. Because like you have more and more isos and you can do these kind of studies. I guess ultimately my question is a strain. Okay, so what you're saying is that it's a genotype, a specific genotype of exactly. a per yeah, certain exactly. origin. Exactly. But if you would self it, say that you have one of the selfing species, if you self it and you take the progeny, what would you call that one? Is it the same strain? Exactly. So, uh, so and this is what makes it uh, a specific strain. So in, in, in hermaphrodites, we know that they reproduce by selfing, right? So, the, the chance of uh, 
of uh, introducing um, heterocygosity in the population is less because they don't mate. Um, though you find so many strains in the wild. So why we did not expect to see so many strains, different strains in gonochorist where you have females because they mate with each other. But we still can see that although they can mate with each other, it seems like, um, and we don't understand this completely yet, it seems like they still can be separated. So you can still define them as different strains as well. So you have different genotypes. Um, if the same worm, and go back to hermaphrodites, if the same worm is reproducing by selfing, this is the same strain. But when you go to another location or another year and you isolate another isolate, a different genotype, this is a, new, a completely new strain. And I'm getting to this right now. It seems like killing efficiency is correlating with how much genomic relatedness is there. Okay, I'll interrupt you again, but uh, continue, please. <laughs> um, okay, so it seems like they like cooperation more than competition in, in, in females. But the hypothesis in hermaphrodites would be that they are sure that they will reproduce. Um, so if I am sure that I, don't need, I do not need to mate in order to assure reproduction, why not to invest on having the predatory mouth form? Because I'm not killing my kids. So here comes the strain thing. So these are, uh, we, this is the, the island that I talked about. These are three different locations. Uh, we took 12 different strains, 12 different genotypes, isolates from, uh, from each location. And what we did is to test all of them against each other. And this is easier, first of all, because hermaphrodites are eurostomatous. So you can, e uh, much easier, in a much easier way, you can find a uh, predatory moth form. In the gonochrist one or in the females, it was harder. And we also sequenced the self one to see if this killing grid will correlate to the self one sequence that we find in these different strains. So the first, uh, conclusion that we got that almost in 60% of the situations, you can see mutual killing. So a strain will kill the, the other pair and the other pair will kill the first strain. In 23% of the interactions, you can see one directional killing. So some of them are cheating. So they will kill, but they will not be killed. And in 20% of the interactions, I'm just like talking about this uh, locality we see a uh, reciprocal recognition. So, and here at this time, would you call these two different strains or not? So they have different genomic composition and they are selfing, but they still do not kill each other. So our first hypothesis was, first of all, it seems from these numbers that almost, uh, this is 60, uh, like 80% of the interactions are competitive. So 80% of the interactions, they, they kill each other, while only 20% they uh, um, um, uh, cooperate with each other. So the question here was, so what mediates this cooperation? So the first hypothesis was self one, the green beard. So if you have the same sequence of self one, you will not kill the other isolate that has the same sequence as well. We tested this long story short, this is not true. I like the slide. So the hypothesis is destroyed. And then like when you bring it back, it looks even more <laughs> like matrix. Anyways, so the second thing, which I really find very astonishing is kin recognition. So we wanted to measure whole genome relatedness, but how can we measure this in a hermaphrodite species? So what um, a very uh, smart bioinformatician here in our lab did is he uh, made this uh, new method of genome-wide relatedness uh, measured uh, based on RNA-seq. So what he did is we did RNA-seq for all, <coughs> for all 36 strains that we have. And then he measured how much differences exist between each pair. 
and then he compared this difference to the average difference in each locality. And from this, he would um, give three categories of relatedness between each two bears, low, sorry, low, medium, and high. And what we see, which was fascinating, that the fraction of killed prey would correlate with overall relatedness, the overall number of SNPs in the whole genome or RNA uh, uh, seek. So in the first, you can see that like when the relatedness is very high, which is between 0.9% to 100%, there is no killing. When it is moderate or medium, the killing is a little bit higher. When the relatedness is very low, they kill each other. And from this, we can say that we call this now kin recognition, not self-recognition, because they are not their own progeny. They're, this is another strain or another isolate. So what we can say that right now that kin recognition mediates social action strategies. And then we actually um, co cooperated with, <laughs> cooperated with uh, people at uh, Max Planck Institute in Plon Evolution Biology to make a model, try to understand this more. I will not go through the details of the model, but what I want to say in the end is um, what we could see that these are three strains, the X, Y, and Z. We model the reproduction uh, mood, the development of speed, the uh, interactions, predation, and competition. And what we find in the end is when R relatedness, the parameter R relatedness is very high, which is 0 0.99. You can see that these two strains between X and Z, Z and X, these two strains coexist with each other, but they overcompete a third strain which is very lowly related to them. But when you get the relatedness to 0 0.5 and you increase the Eurostomatis or the killing uh, predatory mouth form in the green strain, it will kill as well uh, the, the, the purple strain. So you need to have very high relatedness. It's basically you need to have very few SNPs between two different populations so they can coexist if they have the predatory mouth form. So from this, I would say like my take home messages would be that we found for the first time that mouth form reference uh, is, uh, it does correlate with the productive mode. We found that females uh, prefer to be non-predatory. So they prefer to uh, cooperate rather than compete. Hermaphrodites, the other way around. And it seems like overall relatedness is for hermaphrodites specifically, is the factor that uh, make them decide uh, either go EU or ST, kill or not to kill. So if I go to my very early example with my son, I would say that the benefits and costs in, in, in this system is the offspring number. So how to choose the best strategy is to choose the right mouth form and to incorporate this in self-recognition. And when to do this, it depends on your productive mode. And I would say that the best strategy is sex or crime. So if you are um, a female, you would prefer to mate and reproduce, but if I have my diet, you don't mind to kill. Yes, and with this, I thank all the people that were involved in this work. Thank you. Charles, do you want to talk before I talk a lot? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, it's very different from the stuff I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, it's a very deep question. <laughs> 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 now I'm really afraid what's happening there. <laughs> so you say that there's this trade-off, right? Sorry again? I you, say, you say that there's this, this trade-off? Yeah, yes, yes. If you call it a trade-off between... So, well, no, please uh, explain more. What Can you go, you go back?
Iya. Yeah. So these are different strains, right? On the yes. So these are different genotypes, different isolates. So this is the same species. Yeah. So so how they define the species according to the reproductive isolation concept. Uh -huh. Uh, if they can mate, it's one species. So how do you do this in hermaphrodites? In, in the system, they have, I think, something like uh, 20 different markers for each species. They sequence it, and then they say, this is this. This is Pacificus, this is Myeri, this is that species or this species. And then we call them genotypes or isolates because they have completely different genomic uh, components, uh, many different SNPs along the genome. Okay. And the replicates here are three, and those replicates are genomically identical. They're clones. Yes, these replicates are like, for instance, when you test, um, I want two that kill each other. So when you test, yeah. Um, okay, I like, I like this. Looks more fancy. So when you test this one. Um, RC018 against its own self. So you add predators from the 18 adults, Eurus tomatoes, against kids or juveniles from the same strain, and you don't see any killing. And we did it, we do this three times. Right. But when you add kids of this one to predators for this one, you can see from one to 30 corpses. Yeah, okay. So kids. And the right. other way around. So when you test this against this, they kill. When you test this against its own self, it doesn't yeah, kill. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like you see this like white diagonal exactly. line. Exactly. Yes. So it's a test against its own self. Yeah. Which would argue that there is a self recognition system. But then what we could find later, it's not only a self recognition system, it's also a chem recognition system. And here it comes back to your question if what is an isolate, what is a genotype, right? Because if they are 0.99% similar, they don't kill each other. So they are still different isolates. Um, I would still consider them as different genotypes, but like I find it very, I don't know, like what do you do in, in bacterial work for instance, or fungal work whatsoever? How do you, how do you define a strain? Or do you um, well, within like meta barcoding, um, amplicon sequencing, it's just like, yeah, either a, a heuristic at like 97% you define different OTUs. Exactly. Um, but, but you have specific markers, but in this case, I think because we have a lot of data, it's above these markers. But, okay. But like, what is the, what is the mechanism behind the kin selection? Um, this is what my dear Dr. Lightfoot is going to do in his own lab for the next nine years. <laughs> so uh, what are the, what are the hypotheses? So so far we know that self one is involved but it cannot explain as i told you cannot explain all the interactions he's hopefully re, uh, in the next few years um he already know that there is a self too and he's writing the paper and then he might know more and more genes so he's mapping these genes and maybe in the end, it will end up with like, I don't know, six, seven, eight genes, and they can explain this. But what, what are like, so you can, you can statistically is, show, what, yeah, but like, what's the biochemical, but like, yes. mechanism for that? So self one is a small peptide that is expressed in the skin of the worm. Um, and it's very interesting because it does not code for any uh, uh, known proteins, small, very small peptide, short peptide, where is it? Yes, this one. Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it here, um, but it's expressed in the whole 
body of the worm. And what you can see is whenever they are trying to eat the new worm or the, the small worm, they first uh, put their mouth, um, they touch the skin, and then they uh, immediately know if it is their kid or not. So self one uh, should be expressed and what, that's what we show on the skin and then they bite. So self one is more in the ligand side. The receptor side is another story. So what is actually uh, involved in the predator to sense self one. This is also something else that he's, go he's working on right now. So there is a receptor side story and there's a ligand side story. Right. So for, for the receptor side, um, he tried, so these worms have some uh, uh, nose neurons, they call aphid neurons. So he tried to ablate these neurons, so kill them completely. And he could see that killing is affected. So there should be something that is expressed in these nose neurons that sends the signal that comes from the prey. Is it nose neurons? Yes, amphid neurons is like our nose. And those are expressed like consistently around the skin? No, no, no. The, the skin is in the prey. Okay, so yeah. it's in the, it's in the, in it's the in mouth the, part. Exactly. Oh. Wait, I can. Um, no, I need to find the paper. No, I, I, I do not have a, a video of this here, sorry. Um, but I need to find the paper. Um, so um, again, so there are, if you are talking about the biochemical interaction, you have the receptor side, which exists in the predator. So in the mouth of the predator here. So actually this is a round worm. So like there is here and there, this nose openings. So the, this receptor side of self-cognition exists here and there. And when this predator worm come close to, uh, as here, to the prey, they sense if it is their own self or not. And, so like self, and self one is, ex is expressed on the skin of the prey, it's here. So you have, for self-cognition, you have a prey side of the story and you have the predator side of the story. I wonder if you can introduce, like synthesize the ligand or <clears throat> purify it, extract it somehow, and so, then. Yes. Yeah. He, <laughs> uh, he's, he tried this, it didn't work, but he's planning to work. Try, on this. try harder. <laughs> <laughs> like actually mapping this self one took him four to five years. Yeah. So it was uh, because like he reached uh, a genome region where there was no recombination and then he needed to induce recombination by CRISPR himself. And he would get a uh, mutant every 300 worms. So it was a lot of work. So um, I, I think he still have a lot of work, uh, things to discover the molecular bath of self recognition on both sides, predator and prey. Uh, I just think it's so crazy that um, because Charles started like, oh, I don't work with anything like this. And I think when I read the abstract real quick, I was like, I don't work with anything like this. And then you're talking and I'm like, I work with exactly the same thing. <laughs> but being fun guy. <laughs> and in my I still, I, I'm still at the, I don't have anything Yeah, to I can see. <laughs> I, I don't know, it just blew my mind. It's like you're talking about fungi the whole time, but with, with nematodes. <laughs> but you work with this orange crazy... Fungi. No, we talked about this in the, in the conference. Remember, you told me like, oh, I hate Norospora. And I was like, no, I'm not working with that one. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. But no. uh, so are they predatory as well? No, no, no. So, okay, obviously you're in animal world and then you have these kind of things, but... Um, Fungi have their own self-recognition and okay. in here it's about fusing, like um, okay. using your colony or not, <laughs> right? Uh, but it's, 
I'm just really impressed that it, it's like so similar. <laughs> so basically, it's, uh, the reason, okay, so say that you're a fungus, a, a strain, <laughs> you're a strain hanging around, you have your own genotype and so on, and then you encounter another strain or another thing, and then you're like, okay, is that me or not, right? Yes. Because you're a fungus, you don't have a eyes, <laughs> you don't have... You don't uh, have, because you don't have any neurons? Exactly, you have nothing, so what do you do? You, do you so what you do is that you fuse with the cell that you encounter, Okay. and if you are identical at all of this bunch of loci between six and 13, then okay. you fuse. So there is a 13 identified loci for cells. It depends on the, on the fungus. Uh, but for example, in mine, we know of nine, but probably there's more. I, I suspect there might be uh, maybe 10 or 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you have to be identical at all of them. So then the probability of having the same allele at all of them is very low, in fact. And that's why you seldom fuse with something that is not yourself. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it, it can translate that saying as this correlates with the amount of relatedness, right? Yes, exactly. It's exactly the same thing. <laughs> exactly. So what if you're you, saying if, is, if you could like do a whole genome sequencing, I think it will give you the same result. Yes, exactly. The difference is that we know, so we know the genes, so I don't have to worry about the relatedness. Right. I guess, actually, I don't think anybody did it like this because we know about this concept of fusing for a long time. Right. Exactly. So I don't think people were like, oh, what if we check out the relatedness? I, I guess nobody, I don't know, I've never seen it before. Yes. Um, now, the paper that I'm working on, <laughs> Uh, so my fungus that I'm working on is called Podospora, not Nodospora, it's very different, uh, not related actually, or not so related. It's a sulfur, so it can self. Uh, it can outcross sometimes. Okay. We don't know how often. I mean, I, I know for a fact uh, that they do it sometimes in the field, but I don't know how often. And basically we did exactly, like that diagram you show, you know, with all the crosses of everybody against every. I have that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't do it, but pe people did it like in the 70s and then uh, in the 2000s. Okay. Um, so it, it looks very, very similar. I just think it's hilarious because we also have, you know, like, uh, do they, are they identical? Well, they will fuse with themselves, sure. So it's like your white guys uh, on, yes. the, on the left, right? And then uh, sometimes they will, have certain reactions in a symmetrical way as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so some of them will cheat, but they uh, can, because it's a bit more complicated. So the thing is that uh, in this fungus in particular, for some reason, the incompatibility reaction, this self recognition, also has pleiotropic effects on sex. <laughs> Here it is. And this then, really what's happening there? <laughs> I know, I'm like, what the hell? So, they, um, it turns out that say that you cannot fuse because you have different, uh, het, we call it het genes, so heterocarion incompatibility genes. Yes. Um, so, if you have different head genes, you cannot fuse, but sometimes you can just mate fine, right? You just have sex as you do. But sometimes, in certain combinations of alleles, the sex itself also fails in a symmetrical way. So the female fails or something happens. Um, and then in my paper, or what we found out is that actually uh, one of these head genes sort of accidentally became a speciation gene because uh, basically you have this uh, asexual, no, rather the, the sexual incompatibilities both ways by accident yeah. in certain genotype combinations. Yes. So that's kind of like the take home of the paper. <laughs> which, but, uh, which is might actually also be happening here. Uh, we have this uh, floating hypothesis that maybe self one would be at some point involved in as a speciation gene. Which is exactly, the, I think it's incredible this. <laughs> I, I'm like, wow. Uh, <laughs> because it's convergent evolution in a sense, right? Exactly. Which I think is like exactly. the most cool thing exactly. in the universe. Um, yeah, so exactly. I, I think I would expect that you would find, as you were saying, 
10 genes or something, and then eventually, but then that also begs the question, do you see uh, signatures of balancing selection in these genes, right? Because that, that's exactly what we see for, for the head genes. They, they should be evolving under negative frequency dependence. Yes. And that's because, you know, when you're very rare, you're like very rare in the population, you will not fuse with anybody because everybody's different from you. And then because fusing is probably bad, then you have higher fitness. So then you're increasing frequency, right? But now the other allele is more yes, it's rare. Yes, so now it's, I guess, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So then that means that uh, they should evolve under band selection. And, and I find that in, in the SNPs variation, it looks like uh, signatures of balance selection in exactly the genes that we already knew were determining self-known self incompatibility. I, I think like in the future of the system, they will find some stuff very similar to what you're saying. Um, I think so. Because now it was, as I told you, it, it took like him years to get to cell phone but then no, but this is what i'm trying to say actually if you would look if you do it the other way around like look for signatures of balance and selection and these things will pop up and, and then you were like okay you're my candidate to be one of these genes top three or whatever no, but like i don't know like we have more than seven hundred thousands so like I, I don't know genes yeah, no, I know, me too, right? But uh, the thing is that as long as it's under balance and selection, like some signature balance selection, then it becomes your candidate. Because if I do that on my population, I see, you know, I use like the D or something to yeah. measure balance selection. And then I have whatever, 15, 20 peak candidates, and they happen to overlap perfectly with some of the genes we, are, we already knew. Actually, okay. I never thought about this before. It's so cool. I, I think so cool. <laughs> anyway, conclusion, I should hurry up with my paper or you guys are going to scoop me. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, uh, we're still working in some modeling and I, I don't know, we hope that we can finish. Oh, oh, and so we also have modeling. <laughs> <laughs> Not like yours, yours probably looks fancier, but um, a, a guy in my lab did some slim um, yes. work simulations. And basically the conclusion is that this speciation situation can only work if you have some degree of selfing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, like this is the it's same. Like <laughs> We're just using worms and you are using. I know, it's amazing. Uh, it's, but I, I just think it's super cool because- thing, uh, yeah, I think also there is a lady in Harvard. Um, mm -hmm. She's working with bacteria and she was also mentioning very similar stuff. I forgot her name. She gave a talk recently. Um, isn't that beautiful that you see all of this convergent evolution happening so cool. all different levels of organisms? Exactly. I, I think basically that's the conclusion, right? Like we maybe have seen some major uh, patterns of, I, I think it's like some convergence of selection pressures and mating situation and maybe some pleiotropy here and there. And it just maybe reached the same conclusion somewhat. Right? In your case for cannibalism and in my case for a fusion, fusion of vegetative fusion. Yes, which might in the end lead to speciation. Yeah, I think it's amazing. I think. And then if you want to make it even extra cooler, <laughs> so one of the genes that we find, because it's two, it's two genes and they are unlinked, right? That's actually kind of important. This is actually a very good point. So our two genes that we found so far are linked. Uh -huh. uh, okay. But again, this is not in the receptor side. So because like mapping things in the receptor side is harder mm. uh, so far, um, but it's also something that Jim would do in his lab. Um, okay. um, so the self two, I think is linked to the self one, um, but there is also a self three, <laughs> which is in a, a different place. I got, when I was presenting this in a conference, one guy asked me why do you call it self one? Um, ah, okay. It was a very funny question and please, sorry. You know, and you're like, yes, because there's another one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, well, actually, I think it must be similar because in a way, molecularly, one of the genes is recognizing the other, right? Yes. So like, it, in a sense, it's analogous to your exactly. mouth receptor. Very little and, uh, to play. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess it's uh, in some degree similar. But this gene, the one that is recognizing the other one, it's uh, a type of gene called NLR, so not like receptors. Yes. And they occur in animals and plants. 
but in plants, the not like receptors occur for detecting pathogens. So it's not self, non -self uh -huh. it's not like conspecific, but it's pathogens. Mm -hmm. And these genes, uh, when you make hybrids, they create like some self, uh, out, like autoimmune uh, reaction in the hybrids, and that's what kills them. Yes. So it's again like the same type of gene, the same molecular structure. Yes. Under balancing selection because pathogens, who wants speciation? <laughs> it's like, I, 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 really, I really think like in a few years from now, this system of nematodes will be very similar to what you are describing when they know more and more genes. But you know, I think this is now the key. I would have never noticed that these worms are doing this thing if I never saw your talk, right? Like, I don't think we are reading each other's papers. No, 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 completely. I had the same thing for me. So, so then <laughs> you two, you two should write like a, a review. mini mini review. Yeah, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see a I see a collab. <laughs> I think it could work actually because it's this is a problem, systematic problem in science. I think it's like animal people just do their own thing. Yes. Plant people just do their own thing. You know, fungi people doing this, and we all doing the same. It's just we don't talk. Yes. I, I, when I, when I presented this first time in uh, ethology meeting. Like people in the beginning, when I was, I didn't talk about nematodes, like everyone's talking about bats and monkeys and spiders and, and they're like, who's this guy who's talking about nematodes? And yeah. <laughs> after I give the talk, everyone's like, this is great. How is this evolving in such a small system as mm -hmm. nematodes? I, so I completely agree with you. I, I think people should do what you're doing right now more often. Yeah, well, we all should, I guess. This is all thanks to Charles, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> For organizing the seminar. That's what it's all about. Yeah. It will be on the paper. <laughs> at least, at least acknowledgements. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, I mean, like, I don't work with this, but. <laughs> no, yeah, but, cool, cool, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Can you, can you please send me whenever you have time, like mm -hmm. a paper or whatsoever to introduce me to your system? Yes. It's just, you know, the problem with, because if we don't talk, we all get our own terms. And so yeah. it is hidden in this hardcore molecular or, or, or like mycology journals, you know? And, and the language itself is a bit like, huh? Because it's a bunch of terms that are very mycology. And so, for me, it, like, it doesn't matter. I just want to know the what is happening there i can also refer you to the science paper that james published yeah. two years totally. ago totally, totally. Um, and i think this is yeah this is very interesting yes i, I actually can think of one paper uh, it's a review uh, of my fungus mm -hmm. uh, head genes and then it has i think it's hilarious actually because when this is a sad slash funny story when i i was doing my phd i was first worrying like oh is there population structure in my in my fungus you know like what's going on and then i see two distinct plates in a in a specific point of the genome and i was like wow what is that you know and then i check is the head gene that our collaborators just dis just discovered and now we were like, wow, this is amazing. We discovered the speciation genes, blah, 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 blah. And then I opened this paper from the 70s and they already knew it. It's just like they had their, your little cross diagram and you can see two groups. Is there, is there already? Uh, but by the way, uh, there are uh, uh, very old people also in the 60s, a guy work with uh, rotifers. Oh, they cool. have the exact same system as I'm describing. No. Yes. Oh, how cool. <laughs> when we found uh, out about this paper, we were like, oh, seriously? Like, and, but again, he had the problem of calling, he was not clear when he uh, um, called something a strain or a species. I think yeah, that yeah. was 60s and 50s, something like mm -hmm. this. Um, and yeah, like, I, I think there are so many systems that where you have these kind of things. I also, I'll try to find this paper and send it to you. It's a, it's a very, okay. very nice paper. But I, I, I have it somewhere. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Then uh, this is awesome. I, now you inspire me to keep working on my paper because I've been procrastinating as fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was very, I'm, I'm very happy. Thank you, Charles.
despite the <laughs> fact that you two are the only ones here besides me, I think this went really well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quality, yeah. not quantity. <laughs> there you go. I, I agree. I, I actually like the, the question of what is an isolate? Mm. What is a strain? I think, um, yeah, I think uh, like, Maybe we need to make this very clear in our paper because mm. everyone defines strain from his own point of view. For sure. And I really like your suggestion of balancing selection. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's, it's like the next thing to do. It's, uh, it's probably there, right? Because if you maintain the different phenotypes, that must be somehow like something balancing that, you know? Yes. So that's probable. Yes, thank you. Cool. All right. Well, this was great. Uh, I yes. will post this on the YouTube channel. <laughs> and uh, so it looks like from the schedule um, that the next one <laughs> is going to be on July 29th when uh, Nerv is going to be talking about enzymatic fingerprints uh, using mass spec. And then um, Raphael said he can give a presentation in about three weeks. So I will make this announcement when it happens. Cool. Oh, it's, it's a very nice idea. Thank you. I think it's very uh, useful. Excellent. All right. So, see, ya. Thank you. see you. Bye. Bye. See you guys. Bye.